Sketches of Young Couples by Charles Dickens The Young Couple There is to be a wedding this morning at the corner house in the terrace. The pastry cook's people have been there half a dozen times already. All day yesterday there was a great stir and bustle, and they were up this morning as soon as it was light. Miss Emma Fielding is going to be married to young Mr. Harvey. Heaven alone can tell in what bright colours this marriage is painted upon the mind of the little housemaid at number six, who has hardly slept a wink all night with thinking of it, and now stands on the unswept doorsteps, leaning upon her broom, and looking wistfully towards the enchanted house. Nothing short of omniscience can divine what visions of the baker, or the greengrocer, or the smart and most insinuating butterman are flitting across her mind. What thoughts of how she would dress on such an occasion if she were a lady, or of how she would dress if she were only a bride, of how Cook would dress being bridesmaid conjointly with her sister in place at Fulham, and how the clergyman, deeming them so many ladies, would be quite humbled and respectful. What daydreams of hope and happiness, of life being one perpetual holiday with no master and no mistress to grant or withhold it, of every Sunday being a Sunday out, of pure freedom as to curls and ringlets, and no obligation to hide fine heads of hair in caps. What pictures of happiness, vast and immense to her, but utterly ridiculous to us, bewilder the brain of the little housemaid at number six, all called into existence by the wedding at the corner. We smile at such things, and so we should, though perhaps for a better reason than commonly presents itself. It should be pleasant to us to know that there are notions of happiness so moderate and limited, since upon those who entertain them happiness and lightness of heart are very easily bestowed. But the little housemaid is awakened from her reverie, for forth from the door of the magical corner house there runs towards her, all fluttering in a new smart dress and streaming ribbons, her friend Jane Adams, who comes all out of breath to redeem a solemn promise of taking her in, under cover of the confusion, to see the breakfast table spread forth in state, and, sight of sights, her young mistress ready dressed for church. And there, in good truth, when they have stolen upstairs on tiptoe, and edged themselves in at the chamber door, there is Miss Emma, looking like the sweetest picture, in a white chip bonnet and orange flower, and all other elegancies becoming a bride, with the make, shape, and quality of every article of which the girl is perfectly familiar in one moment, and never forgets to her dying day. And there is Miss Emma's mamma in tears, and Miss Emma's sister with her arms round her neck, and the other brides made all smiles and tears, quieting the children, who would cry more, but they are so finely dressed, and yet sob for fear Sister Emma should be taken away. And it is also affecting that the two servant girls cry more than anybody. And Jane Adams, sitting down upon the stairs when they have crept away, declares that her legs tremble so that she don't know what to do. And that she will say for Miss Emma that she never had a hasty word from her, and that she does hope and pray she may be happy. But Jane soon comes round again. And then, surely, there never was anything like the breakfast-table, glittering with plate and china, and set out with flowers and sweets and long-necked bottles, in the most sumptuous and dazzling manner. In the centre, too, is the mighty charm, the cake, glistening with frosted sugar and garnished beautiful. They agree that there ought to be a little cupid under one of the barley-sugar temples, or at least two hearts and an arrow. But with this exception there is nothing to wish for, and a table could not be handsomer. As they arrive at this conclusion, who should come in but Mr. John, to whom Jane says that it's only Annie from number six, and John says he knows, for he's often winked his eye down the area, which causes Annie to blush and look confused. She's going away, indeed, when Mr. John will have it that she must drink a glass of wine, and he says, never mind, it's being early in the morning, it won't hurt her. So they shut the door and pour out the wine, and Anne, drinking Jane's health and adding, and he is wishing you yours, Mr. John, drinks it in a great many sips, Mr. John all the time making jokes appropriate to the occasion. At last Mr. John, 
who has waxed bolder by degrees, pleads the usage at weddings and claims the privilege of a kiss, which she obtains after a great scuffle. And footsteps being now heard on the stairs, they disperse suddenly. By this time a carriage has driven up to convey the bride to church, and Anne of number six, prolonging the process of cleaning the door, has the satisfaction of beholding the bride and bridesmaids and the papa and mamma hurrying into the same and drive rapidly off. Nor is this all, for soon other carriages begin to arrive with a posse of company all beautifully dressed, at whom she could stand and gaze for ever. But having something else to do is compelled to take one last long look and shut the street door. And now the company have gone down to breakfast, and tears have given place to smiles, for all the corks are out of the long-necked bottles, and their contents is disappearing rapidly. Miss Emma's papa is at the top of the table, Miss Emma's mamma at the bottom, and beside the latter are Miss Emma herself and her husband, admitted on all hands to be the handsomest and most interesting young couple ever known. All down both sides of the table, too, are various young ladies beautiful to see, and various young gentlemen who seem to think so. And there, in a post of honour, is an unmarried aunt of Miss Emma's, reported to possess unheard-of riches, and to have expressed vast testamentary intentions respecting her favourite niece and new nephew. This lady has been very liberal and generous already, as the jewels worn by the bride abundantly testify, but that is nothing to what she means to do, or even to what she has done, for she put herself in close communication with the dressmaker three months ago, and prepared a wardrobe, with some articles worked by her own hands, fit for a princess. People may call her an old maid, and so she may be, but she is neither cross nor ugly for all that. On the contrary, she is very cheerful and pleasant-looking, and very kind and tender-hearted, which is no matter of surprise, except to those who yield to popular prejudices without thinking why, and will never grow wiser, and never know better. Of all the company, though none are more pleasant to behold, or better pleased with themselves, than two young children, who, in honour of the day, have seats among the guests. Of these, one is a little fellow of six or eight years old, brother to the bride, and the other a girl of the same age, or something younger, whom he calls his wife. The real bride and bridegroom are not more devoted than they. He, all love and attention, and she, all blushes and fondness, toying with a little bouquet which he gave her this morning, and placing the scattered rose-leaves in her bosom with nature's own coquettishness. They have dreamt of each other in their quiet dreams, these children, and their little hearts have been dispraised in jest. When will there come in afterlife a passion so earnest, generous, and true as theirs? What, even in its gentlest realities, can have the grace and charm that hover round such fairy lovers? By this time the merriment and happiness of the feast have gained their height. A certain ominous looks begin to be exchanged between the bridesmaids, and somehow it gets whispered about that the carriage, which is to take the young couple into the country, has arrived. Such members of the party, as are most disposed to prolong its enjoyments, affect to consider this a false alarm, but it turns out too true, being speedily confirmed first by the retirement of the bride and a select file of intimates who are to prepare her for the journey, and secondly by the withdrawal of the ladies generally. To this there ensues a particularly awkward pause, in which everybody essays to be facetious, and nobody succeeds. At length the bridegroom makes a mysterious disappearance in obedience to some equally mysterious signal, and the table is deserted. Now, for at least six weeks past, it has been solemnly devised and settled that the young couple should go away in secret. But they no sooner appear without the door then the drawing-room windows are blocked up with ladies waving their handkerchiefs and kissing their hands, and the dining-room panes with gentlemen's faces beaming farewell in every queer variety of its expression. The hall and steps are crowded with servants in white favours, mixed up with particular friends and relations who have darted out to say good-bye, and foremost in the group are the tiny lovers, arm in arm, thinking with fluttering hearts what happiness it would be to dash away together in that gallant coach and never part again.